Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is cardiovascular disease in diabetes. Guess what? We're not treating it. Not even close. Now, what do I mean by all this? So, I have to go over a little pathophysiology about cardiovascular disease to start. Now, in diabetes, there is an increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease. Peripheral vascular disease is damage to the small arteries, especially in your feet, somewhat in your hands, but mostly in your feet. And the real problem with peripheral vascular disease is it, lead, it leads to non-healing foot wounds and ulcers and amputations. So it can cause pain, but even beyond pain, you can like lose your foot and lose your leg because of peripheral, peripheral vascular disease. And heart attacks, obviously you know what that is, and a stroke is, a, the majority of strokes are actually the exact same process of atherosclerosis that happens in the heart. So you can think of a stroke as almost like a heart attack of the brain. Now what is atherosclerosis? It is a hardening and narrowing of the arteries. That's what I've drawn here. This is an artery. This is the narrowing. I'm sure you're familiar with this, where the cholesterol blocks more and more and more of the, what is referred to as the lumen or the hole inside of the artery. So the blood can't get through. And then a blood clot spontaneously forms in that little spot and blocks the blood flow completely. And when it blocks the blood flow completely in your heart, it is a heart attack. And when it blocks the blood flow completely in your brain, it is a stroke. And when it blocks the blood flow in your feet, it leads to non-healing ulcers and gangrene and amputations. Now, diabetes makes atherosclerosis worse because it makes these, what are referred to as plaques, these, uh, these groupings of cholesterol that narrows the arteries, it makes the cholesterol extra sticky. Now, high blood pressure is also bad because it causes there to be damage to the plaques themselves and makes them more likely to rupture. Yes, these plaques can rupture and they explode. You have always many explosions of these plaques. When those plaques explode, then you're like really gonna get a blockage. You're not gonna get a little blockage. You're gonna get like a big blockage. So when you have hypertension, it causes those black, more, it makes it more likely that those plaques are gonna explode and really cause a serious blockage. So hypertension and diabetes synergistically combine to make atherosclerosis a lot worse than somebody who does not have diabetes. So if anyone should be treated for their atherosclerosis, what is oftentimes referred to as cardiovascular disease, if anybody should be treated for it, it's people with diabetes. And guess what? We have a lot of really good treatments for people with diabetes and atherosclerosis. They fall into three categories. One are these stat medications like Lipitor and Crestor. I'm sure you've heard of them, right? These stat medications are cholesterol lowering medications. Um, category medication number two are what are referred to as ACE inhibitors or angiotensin, angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs. So you would never give a patient an ACE, you, typically, the vast majority of the time, you would never give them an ACE and an ARB, you would give them one or the other because they work very similarly in your body. So these are actually blood pressure medications, but they actually protect your heart, they protect your blood vessels, they even protect your kidneys, because obviously in diabetes, it's this process of atherosclerosis or damaging of the arteries in the kidneys that actually causes kidney failure. So the underlying cause within diabetics for their problems is this atherosclerosis, okay? So this is really the bad, the bad thing that we need to prevent. It is silent. You cannot feel atherosclerosis. When those plaques explode, you cannot feel it. This is why people have, I feel fine syndrome. I feel fine and all of a sudden, wham, heart attack, wham, stroke, wham, not healing foot ulcers, wham, their kidneys conk out over time. You never feel it and then you have to go on dialysis. This silent disease is hugely problematic for individuals 
and for the people that have to pay for health care, like employers and state governments and city governments and the federal government. Now, the third category are a, a new, very new category of medications. They're referred to as SGL type 2 um, inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor antagonists. I will not get into the detail about these. That is beyond the scope of this talk, but just know that they're new and they do improve outcomes for people with diabetes and cardiovascular vascular disease, atherosclerosis. Now, there was a rhyme I bring this up. You're like, okay, fascinating. I, do, I don't want to go to medical school, Dr. Bricker. Get to the point already. So here's the point. There was a study from the Journal of the American Medical Association. Just came out February 17th of 2022, where they looked at people with diabetes and atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease. And they said, okay, across 12 hospital systems, it was literally hundreds of thousands of patients across the country. These people with diabetes and atherosclerosis, were they being treated with any of these three classes of medications? And guess what? They really weren't. Like, it was bad. It was really bad, okay? 43% of all the patients with diabetes were receiving zero. Almost half the patients were not being treated at all. 32% were being treated with just one medication, and 21% were being treated with two medications. And only like 4%, one in 20, were actually being treated with all three categories of medications. Now, the third category, these brand spanking new medications, I'll give a little leeway on that, because it's new, okay? But the statins and the ACE inhibitors, ARBs, they've been around for decades, well over a decade, over two decades. They've been around for over 20 years. And you mean to tell me that only 20%, one in five, are receiving the two. And by the way, they're dirt cheap. Statin medications are generic. They're dirt cheap. ACE inhibitors and ARBs are dirt cheap. Cost is not the issue. They're like, oh, the medication is too expensive and that's why they're not taking it. No! You can get this stuff for $4 a month for like $9 for a 90-day supply. You can get this stuff super cheap. Some plans even offer it for free. It's so cheap. And it prevents you from dying of a heart attack or not being able to move the left side of your body because of a stroke or having to have your foot cut off because of an amputation. I mean, nobody wants that to happen in a very cost-effective fashion. You can prevent this from happening. Now, the fancy medical term for this, because of course we have to have some sort of fancy medical jargon, this is, these are gaps in evidence-based care. So whenever somebody in a highfalutin way talks about gaps in evidence-based care, what they mean is people are not taking statin medications and they're not taking ACE inhibitor blood pressure medications that prevent people from getting heart attack strokes and having their feet cut off. All right, now, this is a growing problem. Why is this a growing problem? Because the number of people with diabetes is growing. It is now 13% of adults in America have diabetes. Okay, that's up from 8% 20 years ago. So, all right, that's an over 50% increase from 8% to 13% over that 20 years. And it's only going to keep increasing. This is a huge problem for employer-sponsored health plans because they are having their patients treated many times by doctors. Like 75% of these patients had actually been seen by a primary care physician or a cardiologist, and they still were not getting the treatment. So why is that? Because the fee-for-service fee payment system pays the doctors no matter what. There is no accountability for actually following evidence in payment. There is no accountability in the fee-for-service world. So you say, okay, well, we're moving to value-based payment. We should fix all this. Okay, these statistics exist in a value-based payment world. All the commercial insurance value-based care programs, all the Medicare value-based care programs, all the Medicare value-based care programs, they're not moving the needle. Like, these statistics are in a world. 43% of, so you got to judge a tree by its fruit, right? You got to judge the value-based payment tree by its fruit. It ain't working. If, 40, if almost half the people are still not getting any treatment, even with value-based payments, something tells me the value-based payments are not working. So just know 
that the existing physician and hospital infrastructure that we have today here in America is horrible at implementing treatments that we already have. We don't need to discover anything new. We just need to actually implement what we know can help. We in America are horrible at implementing. So if you're an employer, you need to own this problem. I'm sorry. You're like, I don't want to own this problem. I'm sorry, you do. You as an employer are taking the financial risk for this. So guess what? If you're going to take the financial, the doctor doesn't take the financial risk. You, the employer, takes the financial risk. The patient takes the financial risk. So you need to own this implementation problem. Because, and guess what? It's solvable. That's another topic for another day. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Seat.